Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Stubbs, and I lead the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the 10th event in our Lab Notes online series. Today, we're hearing from scientists in our Scotland Research Network, who will share their work studying synapses, which are vital connections between cells in the brain. But first up, just a little bit of housekeeping. During the event, you are welcome to switch on the automatic subtitles using the CC button at the bottom of your screen. As they are generated automatically, they aren't 100% accurate, but we will be editing them so that they are correct on the event recording. If you've missed previous events, you can watch back any of them in your own time, as they are all available on the Lab Notes webpage or on our YouTube channel, and we'll just pop the links in the chat now. During the event, if you would like to ask a question, you just need to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your question. So before we get going, we've got a couple of poll questions for you today. And if you come along before, you're probably familiar with them, but they help us to know the reasons why you've attended today, your, how you rate your current knowledge of dementia, and whether you've attended one of our Lab Notes events before. So I'll just pause while those are on your screen and you can submit your answers to them. There we go, I can see the answers starting to come in now. Just hold on until we've got most people having submitted. Okay, I think most people have done it now, so we'll share the results with you. So most people coming along today, you rate your knowledge of dementia research about average. Got some people who are finding, think they've got high or very high, which is really great to hear. Hopefully you'll all learn something from coming along today. Um, uh, the question, which of these best describes your reason for attending today? Um, majority of people, it's because they have some personal experience, so a friend or a family member has dementia or their work is related to dementia. And we've got a split uh, in about two thirds of people have come along before, but we've still got some newcomers, which is great. So we're all very grateful to have you along. So thank you for coming. Um, so I'm just gonna do a short intro before we move to our main speakers. Um, and I just wanna share some brief updates from us here at Alzheimer's Research UK. So first up, we're gonna play our brand new short video, which talks about the progress being made in dementia research and the breakthroughs on the horizon. It's part of our campaign to build understanding of the importance of dementia research. And we're really grateful to Julie Walters for lending her voice to it. So we'll just play that video for you now. Every giant leap for humankind is the culmination of a million breakthroughs that suddenly make the impossible possible. In medicine, dementia is the greatest challenge of our generation, but we are closer than ever to making a giant leap of our own. The few dementia treatments we have today came about thanks to decades of prior research. And like progress in the decades between the Wright brothers' first flight and the mission that took us to the moon, Research into dementia has accelerated at a phenomenal rate, putting new, life-changing treatments within reach. Now one of the fastest growing areas of medical research, funding for dementia research has doubled in the last decade, and with it, the rate of new discoveries. Blood testing is now 1,000 times more sensitive than previous approaches, Advances in brain imaging, genetics, stem cell technology and AI have given researchers an edge they've never had before. The discovery of the Alzheimer's risk gene, TREM2, has spurred crucial new approaches for thousands of scientists, helping bring new, potentially life-changing treatments to clinical trials. This progress can't stop now. By joining forces across the world, we're building momentum to reach new heights in dementia research. Together, we can create a future free from the fear, 
harm and heartbreak of dementia. So that video just really makes the case for how far we've come with dementia research, but also how far we still have to go to really deliver the life changing breakthroughs that we so urgently need to see for people affected by dementia. And this was brought home to us even more last week with some new study findings that came out of a conference. So the 2021 Alzheimer's Association International Conference, it's the biggest gathering of dementia researchers in the world and new, present, new research presented at the conference predicted that worldwide cases of dementia are set to triple to 152 million by 2050. And you may have seen this reported in the media last week, and our chief executive, Hilary Evans, spoke about the critical importance of research to change this. And other research at the conference highlighted the impact that improving brain health could have to reduce the number of people developing dementia. And our Think Brain Health campaign was created to do that, to build understanding of the things we each can do to help support our brain health. And our three simple rules are love your heart, stay sharp and keep connected. And you can find out more about brain health on our website, where there are practical tips, further information about the research into brain health as well. And we all know that doing these things has been more challenging over the last year due to social restrictions, but as restrictions ease, it's been great to see the return to events and activities that can help us all look after our brain health. And one of the ways to do this is Park Run that you may have heard of. And we've been the official charity partner of Park Run since 2015. And over the last six years, people taking part in Park Runs have raised over one and a half million pounds for our pioneering dementia research. Park Runs are free five kilometer events that take place in parks in the UK and now worldwide. And they are a chance for people, regardless of age or gender or ability, to regularly run, jog or walk together. And we were delighted to see Park Run events begin again across England and Northern Ireland in July, after 16 months of none taking place due to COVID restrictions. For Wales and Scotland, Park Runs are due to restart from mid-August in line with the easing of restrictions by the Welsh and Scottish governments. So if you're looking for a way to get more active, why not check out a Park Run near you? They're really welcoming events and are held by local volunteers. And you don't have to be a seasoned runner to take part. You can be a total beginner or just keen to walk the distance of the park run. Everyone is welcome. So those are my short updates for this month. Um, and today we're going to be hearing in the main part of the event from researchers in our Scotland Research Network. And this network is one of 15 that we support across the UK, providing funding for research, networking and collaboration and also helping researchers to share their discoveries and progress with the public. So first up today, we'll hear from Professor Tara Spires-Jones from the University of Edinburgh, and then from Sarah Hesse from the University of Glasgow. Both speakers study synapses, which are the connection points between nerve cells in the brain. They will share insights from their work into how these connections are affected in Alzheimer's and how understanding this paves the way to innovative new treatments for Alzheimer's. Once they've given their talks, I will then return to screen and we'll move to the Q&A part of today's session. You can submit questions at any point during the event and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. I should say that both speakers today are research scientists and not medical doctors. And so there may be some questions that we aren't able to answer today. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Tara Spires-Jones. Over to you, Tara. Thank you, Katie. I'll remember to unmute after a year and a half. You'd think I'd be good at this by now. And let me just share my slides for you all. So you should be seeing my presentation. Thank you very much for coming today. Let's see if I can get it in presentation mode. There we go. Thank you very much for coming today. It's great to be here and speak to you all. I do miss in-person events where we can take you around the lab, but still, uh, hopefully you'll learn something today and I can give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing to study those synaptic connections that Katie mentioned in her excellent introduction. So what I'll do in this very brief talk is talk a little bit about why we work on Alzheimer's disease and the brain, then a little bit about the past, our history, what we know about the brain and Alzheimer's disease from prior research, a little bit of our current data, and this is my current research group. You've probably all seen this um, 
uh, hopefully you can see my little pointer here, but this fellow here, Alois Alzheimer, who described the disease first. So I'll talk a little bit about the past and what we know about the brain, then our work here at the University of Edinburgh with this fantastic group of people. And finally, a little bit about a uh, future path to life-changing treatments for dementias. And this is uh, the future. This is actually my son looking down a microscope when we were still allowed to see people. But you'll see some of the actual future of dementia research when Sarah, who's an early career researcher, um, comes to give her talk. So for the past, what do we know about the brain? Well, I'm maybe a tiny bit biased, but your brain is absolutely amazing. Uh, we have, you'll be familiar, of course, with the brain and how you've got these, this beautiful organ in your head and the beautiful curves in the cortex. And if we look at it in a little bit more detail, you can see the white matter here on the inside of the brain. What I'm showing you here is a, a section through a post-mortem brain tissue uh, brain after someone has generously donated it when they died and it's cut through a coronal plane like this direction and you can see the gray matter which is actually quite pinkish on the outside and that's where the brain cells mainly live and the white matter that's here on the inside and the white matter is the wires that connect the cells together so the the gray matter is where the neurons which are drawn here by one of the greats of our neuroscience um, history who is Santiago Ramon y Cajal uh, one of the first people to look down a microscope at, at the brain. So the neurons are the cells that do the talking in the, in the network, and they talk to each other through little connections. They have these beautiful processes, dendrites that receive signals and axons that sig send signals. And at the end of the axon, there's a connection point between two neurons, and that's called the synapse that Katie mentioned. That's what I work on. Uh, and here is a, an electron micrograph of a synapse, and you can see the scale bar here is 0 0.001 millimeters. So these are very tiny connections. And the signal comes from the presynaptic neuron down the axon, gets the signal, the neurotransmitter gets released into the synaptic cleft and gets taken up here by the postsynaptic neuron uh, in the dendritic spine usually or on the dendrite. And in your brain, which is absolutely incredible, you have 10 to the 11th or 100 billion neurons approximately, and 100 trillion or 10 to the 14th of these synaptic connections. And they're really what makes thinking possible. So that's more synaptic connections in your brain than there are stars in our galaxy, which I think is just phenomenal. And so they're really key. You learn new things and remember things through these synaptic connections in these neuronal networks. And so it's no surprise that these decline in Alzheimer's disease. So why study Alzheimer's disease? Well, I'm sure many of you have personal stories uh, that you could share with us about your experience of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Uh, for me, I, have, I had a grandmother who had fantastic cognition all the way through her age. My other grandmother, my Mima, also had fantastic cognition all the way through her life. And she just died last year, uh, or this year actually. And my grandmother-in-law, though, was one of those people who developed dementia as she aged. And you will all be aware of how difficult it is for the people living with it and, of course, for their families. And as Katie mentioned, it's a big problem not just here but worldwide. This is some slightly older data, data than the data you, you heard about this morning already. So this is a big problem. And currently, it's costing us over £26 billion per year to to care for people with dementia. There aren't really any effective treatments, although very recently there was one um, disease modifying drug approved in the United States provisionally. Uh, but what we do know is that research will eventually lead to these really life-changing treatments for dementias, or hopefully also ways to prevent dementia altogether. What do we know about what causes dementias, including Alzheimer's disease? So this is quite important because as Katie mentioned, there are lifestyle factors that we can use to, to maintain your brain health. And some of these center on the synapses that we'll be talking about today. We know that the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is aging. And of course, we can't do anything about that. We're lucky to, to be aging. Uh, genes, which we can't do anything about the genes that we inherit. But there's also these lifestyle factors that we can do something about. We can change our lifestyles in order to lower our own risk. This isn't in any way to blame people who have dementias because over two thirds or approximately two thirds of the risk factors for dementia are those things we can't do anything about. But it's just to say that we can, to some extent at least, reduce our own risk. And things that are associated with increased risk of dementia are smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, physical inactivity, and more recently, it's been discovered that social isolation, social isolation, depression, and hearing loss are associated with increased risk of dementia. You have to think about these sort of things with a slight grain of salt because we don't really know whether hearing loss is itself, for example, a risk factor for dementia or whether um, 
the parts of the brain that are important for hearing are perhaps damaged. Similarly with social isolation, we don't know whether social isolation is directly leading to uh, brain changes that cause dementia or whether the early brain changes of dementia actually lead you to be isolated. So um, we don't know exactly how these things work yet, which is what, why we're doing research, but we do know that they're associated with them. So those are things we can try and avoid, particularly smoking and high blood pressure and cardiovascular risk factors are things that we should try to keep ourselves generally healthy anyway. And on the good side, things that are associated with reduced dementia risk are things like exercise, a healthy diet, level of education, keeping active physically and socially. So well done for being here because you're engaging your brain and you're engaging your synapses. But what we don't really understand yet is the biological links between these risk factors and disease. So how do these risk factors change your brain, if that's in fact what's happening, to make you more vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease? So that's one of the key things we're looking at in our lab in Edinburgh. So a little bit more background about what we already know about Alzheimer's disease. I've introduced the brain and the risk factors for Alzheimer's, but what's going on in the brains of people who are living with Alzheimer's disease? Well, this was described, as I mentioned, in the early 1900s by Alois Alzheimer. And the first person that he described about, uh, to have this disease was August Dieter. So this woman came to him as a, as a neuropsychiatrist, and she had all of the symptoms that you'll all be familiar with of Alzheimer's disease. She said, I lost myself. She couldn't remember, she couldn't think very well. And when she died, Alzheimer looked at her brain and he described the three features of the brain that we still use today to define Alzheimer's disease pathology. These are atrophy, and you can see atrophy illustrated here in a control brain that I've shown you earlier. And comparing that to someone who had Alzheimer's disease when they died, you can see the shrinkage. So that's atrophy, that's loss of brain cells and loss of synapses that we'll talk about. And you also, if you look with a microscope, Alzheimer described the two accumulations of pathological proteins that you've probably heard of, which are plaques and tangles. Plaques made of amyloid beta peptide that accumulates clumps up outside of brain cells in the, what we call the parenchyma or the space around the brain cells and tangles, which are formed of tau protein and that clumps up inside the neurons themselves. We also know that it's not just all about the neurons and the plaques and the tangles, but the immune cells in the brain, the microglia and the support cells, the astrocytes, are also accumulating around plaques. And we think now are actually contributing to the disease process in many ways. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the data. But these pathologies don't occur all at once all over the brain. As you'll be aware, it's a very slowly progressing insidious disease. So what happens over time, if you look at aging on the x-axis from people who are completely healthy and white to people who have brain changes but no symptoms in gray here called prodromal to people who have mild symptoms or detectable changes if you took a, a test to see if your brain function was okay to people in the light gray who have Alzheimer's disease diagnoses. What we see is in the decades leading up to changes that cause symptoms, you have accumulation of those plaques, the amyloid beta plaques. And you have a little bit of tau accumulation. Most of us as we age have a little bit, but really that doesn't start to ramp up and spread through the brain until you start to have detectable cognitive changes. And once you start to have those cognitive changes, you get the loss of the brain cells or neurons. But what we'll focus on today is the loss of those synaptic connections between neurons is actually the closest pathological correlate or the closest thing that changes in the brain to what we see symptom wise. So um, synapse loss correlates very strongly with cognitive decline or loss of thinking ability. And again, here's one of these lovely little synapses. So we've known this for about 20 years or actually since the early 1990s, so probably more than that now, that synapse loss is the strongest pathological correlate of dementia symptoms in Alzheimer's disease specifically. So that's the introduction. I'm sorry that it took so long, but it, you, you know, get a little background for you. But what I'll do now for just a few minutes is tell you about some of our data and then how we're thinking moving forward. So we know that these risk factors that I mentioned, age, genes, and lifestyle, are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Early on, you have that accumulation of plaques. Later on, you have the accumulation of tangles, and this is associated with cognitive impairment. What we don't really know is how synapse loss is contributing to this or when it occurs. So what we're looking at is what causes synapse loss and can we prevent or hopefully even reverse it. And what we found is that genetic risk factors, APOE and clustrin, uh, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, are associated with amyloid beta clumping up in synapses. And there's this important thing that I'll talk about a little bit, this neuron glia interactions, that it's not just the neurons themselves, but these glial cells seem to be involved in synapse degeneration. 
So what I hope to convince you of in the next five minutes is that multiple pathological proteins, both A, beta, and tau, and ApoE and clustrin, which are these risk factors, contribute to synapse dysfunction and loss. And in mice, at least, these changes are reversible. We hope they will be also in people. So we answer these questions using multiple models. In our lab, we look at human postmortem tissue samples, tiny bits of brain tissue that are really generously donated by people and their families after they die. We use uh, cell culture models. So we use induced pluripotent stem cells. We can change human blood cells into neurons, and we can test or answer questions in them. And we use both mouse and fly models of the disease that have an intact brain. I'll talk a little bit about the human data today mainly, and a little bit about the cell culture data. So these are data from human brain. This was led first by a former PhD student, Robert Kofi, when I was still in Boston, and more recently by Ellie Pickett when she was a PhD student here in Edinburgh. And what we found is that that plaque protein, A beta, and specifically soluble forms of it that we call oligomers, clump up inside synapses. This is the percentage of synapses that contain this oligomeric A beta. And as we get closer to the plaque, we get more and more of the synapses positive for this signal. So this is telling us that one of the things that plaques might be doing is damaging those synaptic connections in your brain. We also saw with Robert and subsequently with uh, Rosie Jackson here in Edinburgh that ApoE4, which is one of the biggest genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, uh, causes an increase in the amount of this A beta clumping in synapses. So in this, we've used a little bit of human postmortem brain and we've stained presynaptic terminals in green, ApoE, the risk factor in red, and A beta labeled with NAB61 in blue. And occasionally you can see little synapses that are positive for the A beta shown here with the arrow. And you can see here the synapse density as you get near plaques in Alzheimer's disease brain goes down. So you're losing synapses near plaques. That's worse in people who have this risk gene ApoE. And if we look at the percentage of synapses that have the toxic A beta, it goes up fivefold in people who have a, a copy of this ApoE gene. The synapses that contain ApoE and A beta is hugely increased. So we think one of the ways this ApoE gene is increasing risk is by causing this toxic A beta to clump in synapses. And we saw very similar results with Rosie Jackson, uh, which we published a couple of years ago now in Brain Communications with a different risk gene called clustrin. So ApoE and clustrin are both genes expressed in astrocytes, one of these glia, but they do similar things in the Alzheimer's brain as far as we can tell at the level of the synapse. We see clumping of the amyloid beta shown in blue here and the clustrin shown in pink within individual presynaptic terminals. And this happens more in people with the ApoE4 gene. So this is now two genetic risk factors that we think are affecting your risk by affecting your synapses. And finally, I told you I would talk a little bit about glia. So microglia, which are the brain's immune cells, they are normally uh, functioning by uh, eating, micro eating um, bacteria or viruses that come into your brain. But one of the things that seems to be happening in AD and work led by a former PhD student and now postdoc, um, Dr. Marcus Joris, is that we see microglia are eating synapses. So the microglia are stained here in sort of this magenta color and the synapses are stained in the green color and you can see the synapses inside the microglia. And that happens a lot more in Alzheimer's disease brain than it does in control people who did not have any cognitive symptoms. And it also happens more near plaques. And when Marcus had the really cool opportunity to look at human microglia that were alive, uh, we saw something pretty amazing. So this has been made possible by collaborations with Veronica Marone and Barry McCall and some neurosurgical colleagues. And what happens is people who are undergoing surgery for epilepsy or a brain tumor and having a bit of their tumor or their epileptic focus removed, normally there's a little bit of healthy brain that the surgeon has to go through that gets thrown away. But some of these people have very generously agreed to let us have that tiny bit of normal appearing brain and we can keep it alive in culture. So here are some cultured microglia. So from an adult human who had epilepsy that are living little microglia, we fed them synapses that we had isolated from the, from the postmortem Alzheimer's or control brain tissue. And what we see is microglia, living human microglia, eat the synapses and they eat the Alzheimer's synapses more than the controls. So there's something on those Alzheimer's synapses that's signaling to the microglia to eat them. And the final bit of data that I'll show before 
moving on and finishing up because I realize I'm taking up a little bit more than my 15 minutes, apologies, is that we're starting to see links between lifestyle and, and changes, inflammatory changes in your body and cognitive decline with age. So this was work led by Anna Stevenson when she was doing her PhD with myself and Ricardo Marioni. What Anna observed is that if you look in people's blood, markers of changes caused by systemic inflammation, which goes up with things like smoking and obesity, uh, go up with age that this marker of, of systemic inflammation was associated with this smoking and high BMI, which is linking lifestyle to brain changes, and it was also associated with poor cognitive skills during aging. And when Anna looked in our lab at the brain, she saw those microglia, which I just mentioned, eat synapses, go up, and the same part of the brain, the hippocampus, shown here is HC. So this is the microglial burden is highest in the hippocampus. And that's the same place where this epigenetic or DNA signature of aging is highest. So we're starting to tease out links between lifestyle, changes in your brain cells, in particular microglia, changes in your synapses, and changes in and how those all sort of clump together with your genes to increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And in the future, we hope we'll be able to leverage what we're learning in our fundamental science lab to develop these life-changing treatments with colleagues. So one of the things that's going on right now, based in the small part on our research, is a clinical trial by Cognition Therapeutics that actually can knock toxic amyloid beta off of synapses. And they're doing this in phase two now. A disclaimer, I'm now advising them as a scientific advisor. But it's promising. We'll see if it works. It's only in phase two, which means it's been shown to be safe, but we don't know if it works yet to help people who have Alzheimer's disease. But we contribute a little bit of data to the papers that underpinned this. So this is just to show you that the basic, basic research I've been telling you about in our lab is important and does eventually lead through to these types of clinical trials. So what I hope I've convinced you of today is that we're using multiple different approaches to make progress in understanding how the brain changes in Alzheimer's disease. Genes, age, and lifestyle factors are converging, at least in part, on damaging these synaptic connections that I'm showing you here in red, a nice little movie of them spinning around. And we hope that targeting synapse pathology will be a promising therapeutic strategy. So just to say thank you to especially the people who donated small pieces of their brain and their families and all of the lab members who made this work possible. And what I'll do now is I will hand over to Sarah, our next speaker. So I'll stop sharing here in a second. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. I will try to share my screen now. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's, the, it's up. Yes, perfect. So thank you again, Tara, for your great talk and for the introduction. Um, so as Tara has already mentioned, my name is Sarah Hesse, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Glasgow. And my subject area is called translation and pharmacology. So this means that the main focus of my research involves the study of medicine at a molecular level with the aim of using them or translating them into more clinical settings. And after Tara has told us a bit about her lab's research and studying why synapses die and how we can tackle this, I'll tell you a bit more about another approach that the lab that I'm in is taking now. So today I will first talk a bit about dementia and Alzheimer's disease then why connections in the brain matter, and finally give a specific example of um, a protein called the M1 receptor. But first, um, I want to start with some pictures. And as Tara said, um, a lot of people, including us, probably um, have a connection to Alzheimer's. So um, I'm a small person in this picture, and the gorgeous lady is my great-grandmother who had Alzheimer's disease. Um, and when I was small, my great uh, my grandma would actually quite often look after me and my great grandma the mother at the same time. And over time, you could actually see how I was learning while she would forget certain things. So, for example, um, when I was small, she would stack wooden blocks for me, um, which I then would kind of throw down, making her a bit upset with me. But a year or two later, um, she would then walk by and tip over the house that I had built, and making me a bit upset in turn. Um, and she also usually couldn't stack them anymore herself. So this gives you a bit more insight into why I personally care about dementia research uh, and trying to help people living with dementia. But probably many of you here also care very strongly and deeply about dementia research. But as has already been said before, just to drive home the point why everyone should care, at the moment there are over 1 million people living um, with dementia in the UK. And this number is predicted to double by 2050 or maybe even triple based on those new numbers. And even though 
um, we won't be able to re reduce this number. What we're aiming to achieve with the research in our lab is to make the lives of those, those affected better. So dementia is the umbrella term for many diseases where mem memory, language, and critical thinking can be affected. And several forms of dementia are actually caused by neurodegeneration, which causes brain cells to be damaged and die. And all neurodegenerative diseases mainly affect the neurons or cells in the human brain. And the neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system, which, which includes the brain and the spinal cord and the, the nerves in your periphery, kind of controlling your arms and the legs. Um, but neurons normally don't reproduce or replace themselves, so when they become damaged or die, they can usually not be replaced easily by the body. So when brain cells die, the communications between the network of cells are interrupted, and this can then lead to communication problems between brain cells as more and more connections are lost. So neurodegenerative disease is actually another umbrella term for various distinct diseases, but this includes Alzheimer's disease. And even though these diseases causing new generation are um, different diseases, they have a number of features in common, um, which Tara has already mentioned as well. So <clears throat> these include the death of neurons or brain cells, which is called new neurodegeneration, giving these diseases their name. The damage is usually progressive, and that means that it gets worse as the disease progresses. The biggest risk factor for these diseases is aging. So for example, one in 10 individuals over the age of 65 actually has Alzheimer's disease. Genetic factors can also influence, also influence how likely it is for a person to get a specific neurodegenerative disease, and in some cases that can be inherited. These diseases all also have common mechanisms underlying them. This includes inflammation in the brain, which is then called neuroinflammation, and accumulation of misfolded toxic proteins in the brain. Um, and as Tara also mentioned before, importantly, these diseases um, have uh, diseases are linked by the fact that there's currently no treatments that can halt progression of disease. So, like I just told you, Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disease, and the toxic buildup of, of normal proteins, which are mostly amyloid beta and tau in Alzheimer's, can happen more than 10 years before symptoms show, and these get worse over time. And the loss of brain cells, which by caused by the disease, leads to shrinkage of the brain, which is also progressive. So there's two uh, brain areas that I will mainly talk about. Um, so one of them is the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain which is crucial for the formation of new memories. So this is one of the first areas affected in Alzheimer's disease. And in severe Alzheimer's here, you can see um, that the hippocampus is kind of quite a lot smaller. And that's why people with Alzheimer's can often remember things that happened in their past, but have difficulty forming new memories. The other area is the cerebral cortex, which is also extremely affected in Alzheimer's disease. And normally this region is important for language and information processing. And in Alzheimer's disease, you can again see that this, the area of this, um, this area has kind of shrunken quite a lot. And this leads then to problems in planning, thinking, and remembering. But now moving on to connections, Neurons communicate with other neurons by sending and receiving electrical and chemical signals by tri trillions of specialized connections called synapses. And the dendrites that are these parts here, the dendrites, they kind of act like antenna picking up messages from other nerve cells. And these messages are then passed down to the cell body here, which determines if the message should be passed on, whether it's important enough. And the ones that the cell body sites are important, then get passed along the length of the nerve cell to the terminal of the neuron. And here they are relayed through the connection interface between neurons, which is called the synapse. And that's what we're going to look at in a bit more detail now. So as the electrical signal travels along the axon towards the synaptic terminal, it triggers the release of chemical messengers that are stored in, the, in bags called vesicles at the terminal of the sending neuron. And these chemical messengers are called neurotransmitters. And examples of these are acetylcholine, serotonin, and dopamine. But the one that I'm mostly interested in is acetylcholine. So neurotransmitters are then released into the space between the neurons and they activate the receptors on the receiving nerve cell. And receptors are proteins that mediate the connection between cells. So there's many different types depending on the messenger, but their function is mainly to pass on the messages from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. 
And that's exactly what happens here by stimulating the receiving cell and the message can then continue on. And we just talked about the connection between different brain cells and how brain cells can communicate with each other by transmitting these signals, a release from the sending neuron initiating a signal in the receiving cell. There usually isn't just one synapse, but there's usually many. So in Alzheimer's disease, two things happen that can affect how well neurons are connected and messengers can be passed on. So the first thing, A, is that neurons are damaged and die, meaning that the sending cell is not there anymore and no messages can get passed on to the receiving cell. And the second thing, B, is that the levels of the messenger acetylcholine are diminished, meaning that the signals received by the receiving cell is reduced. And both of these mean that the connections between cells are reduced or lost. So now in our research uh, in the lab, we actually use mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. But because mice don't actually get Alzheimer's disease, we're using a model where mice have a form of neurodegeneration caused by prion disease. And we're using this model because it has many similarities to what we can find in Alzheimer's. So in both, we can see quite a lot of uh, inflammation in the brain. Um, and we can also find quite a bit of toxic misfolded proteins. So in prion, that's the prion protein. And in Alzheimer's disease, that's primarily tau and amyloid beta. And the levels of the messenger acetylcholine that I talked about is also reduced. However, the levels of the receptor that we're interested in, called the M1, on the receiving cell is the same in healthy brains and brains with the disease. We also have memory impairment, but interestingly, we find that this memory impairment can actually be treated by the nepazil, which some of you might have heard of before or might even take, because it's one of the treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And the nepazil acts by increasing the levels of acetylcholine by stopping the breakdown. So this suggests that memory itself, the memory impairment here is linked to reduced messenger levels. So I want to start out by showing you a brain section from these mice under the microscope. So this is the hippocampus of, um, this is the hippocampus of a healthy mouse brain. And as I've mentioned earlier, we're looking at the hippocampus because it is an important brain area for memory. And we have stained glial cells here in brown, um, which are some of the immune cells of the brain indicating inflammation. So if you look a bit closer, you can say that the cells kind of look quite round, smooth and happy, which are indicated by the kind of purple blobs. So now if you compare this to uh, the hippocampus of a mouse with prion disease, you can immediately see that there's a lot more brown staining marking um, the glial cells indicating more inflammation. And you can also see that the hippocampus in general looks a bit smaller than in the healthy mouse. And also that actually the bands of cells in purple are a bit slimmer, indicating loss of some cells. So now in our lab, a lot of the research focuses on one of these receptors uh, important for passing on the messages from the, um, into the receiving cell. And I've already mentioned this, it's called the M1 receptor. And I will now explain why this receptor is a promising drug target for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So the M1 receptor is found in large quantities in the cortex and the hippocampus. And as I've mentioned earlier, these are key brain regions for memory and learning. And as I've said before, receptors pass on messages from the outside of the cell into the cell. And the M1 receptor that we're interested in is one of the main receptors with this job in the parts of the brain important for memory. So now, as I've told you earlier, in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease, um, neurons that release, uh, sorry, that release acetylcholine are lost due to the death of the damaged neurons um, and that the level of the messenger acetylcholine itself is reduced. And this makes it a lot more difficult for messages to travel along neurons because the connection between brain cells is lost. So the current frontline treatments for Alzheimer's disease mainly act to increase the level of this chemical transmitter in the brain, but they are sometimes ineffective and induce several side effects limiting how much of the drug someone with Alzheimer's can safely take. So we will still need better treatments that can both improve the symptoms of disease and also stop progression of disease. So in the lab, we've been using a compound that helps amplify the signal of the um, messenger acetylcholine at the M1 receptor. So you can imagine it a bit like turning up the volume on the radio so that you can hear the song, or in this case, a memory more clearly. So this kind of boosts the signal in the receiving neuron. 
So just to give, give you a quick overview of what we found in the lab. So disease in our mouse model um, leads to memory problems and a reduced life expectancy. And we can also find a buildup of toxic protein as well as inflammation. And when we then use the M1 receptor compound that is talked about, all of these effect, effects of disease are reversed. So memory is better and lifespan is longer and there are reduced levels of inflammation and toxic proteins. So finally, I will tell you a bit more about my, my current work. Um, and it's still a bit of uh, work in progress, um, but we think that it is important to understand the effect of disease in the whole brain to understand it better. And because of that, I've been trying to use a technique called clarity. And usually if you look at the brain, you wouldn't think that you can just take images throughout the brain images on the surface. So this is kind of mouse brain from the top. Um, so in this technique, however, you can use chemicals to build a scaffolding in the brain, which all receptors and proteins stick to, but lipids do not. And the lipids are what gives the brain its color. So once you have built a scaffolding, you can then wash, wash out the lipids. And over time, the brain gets more and more clear and transparent, making it easier to kind of take pictures. We also have mice that have a tag on the M1 receptor that I've been talking about, and this tag looks green when looked at under the microscope in certain light. So it's a bit like this. And here's a short video of a brain slice where you can see some staining in green showing what the M1 receptor is. Okay. So uh, once I've established this technique a bit better, we're planning to see whether the prion infection changes where the M1, the M1 receptor is localized. So other people have shown that the overall number of receptors stays the same in people with Alzheimer's disease compared to those who don't. But with new technology coming out, we might be able to more precisely see where the receptors are. So overall, to summarize, connections between brain cells are important and the M1 receptor is a promising drug target to improve connectivity between neurons. So thank you so much for listening and I hope that you found the talk interesting. I would also like to thank my supervisor, Sophie Bradley and Andrew Tobin. Thank you to Colin Malloy for helping me with the animal work and Colin Doney for helping me with the brain imaging and everyone else in the Center for Translation and Pharmacology for their support. I would also like to thank the College of NBLS at the University of Glasgow for funding my PhD, as well as Alzheimer Research UK and the MRC for some funding some of my research. And finally, here's one last picture of me with my great grandma. Um, and I didn't get to spend enough time with her, but very much enjoyed growing up around her. Thank you very much. So now I will pass back on to Katie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'll just wait for Tara to come back and then we will move to the Q&A section of the event. So both your talks were really, really interesting. And I think one of the first questions that um, has come to me when listening to you is that these connections, these synapses, are, as you say, they're really, really important. And actually the current treatments we have work at this point and they help with the symptoms. But am I right in thinking that it's, it's also possible that by changing some of the biology at these connections that we could also slow down the disease as well as helping with the symptoms? Is that the ultimate aim to slow down the disease and help with the symptoms? I don't know, Tara, if you want to take that one. Sure, absolutely. That's the goal. So as you mentioned, the current treatments that help the uh, acetylcholine receptors, for example, they help your thinking a little bit by boosting it. But what we hope to do, if we can really get at that underlying biology linking your aging and your risk factors, if we can stop that process by targeting the synapse and stopping damaging them, that should slow the process or prevent the process from happening, we hope. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and one of the first questions we've had come through and actually one I, I did want to kind of explore a bit with you is you've both been talking specifically about Alzheimer's disease and how this type of dementia really affects the synapse. But am I right in thinking that other types of dementia also see changes at the synapse? Are there lessons that can be kind of moved across to these other types or is it different? I don't know, it, yeah, it's a very open question. Tara, do you wanna take that one first? Sure, I can start. Definitely synapses are, as Sarah mentioned, degenerate in all of these neurodegenerative diseases. And even if we look at the level of protein accumulation, 
Alzheimer's disease is specifically that I beta and tau, but for example, in dementia with Lewy bodies, another type of dementia, we see alpha synuclein accumulating, so a different protein, but it still clumps at the synapses. And in some types of frontotemporal dementia, you have tau accumulation, a little bit like what we see in Alzheimer's. And in those diseases, we're starting to look now in the lab, and we're seeing some tau accumulating in those synapses as well. Do you have more to add on that, Sarah? Um, I think what I just wanted to add on is kind of that I think we still really don't know why certain neurons are more affected than others. So, for example, also in Huntington's disease, which has a component of dementia, we have no idea why those particular neurons are kind of affected first. And I think we still don't really know why it happens that way it does in Alzheimer's disease. So we know certain neurons are affected first and they die first, but we don't know why. Um, so I think, yes, there's definitely a big component across dementias. Um, but yeah, I think that's why we need more research to kind of study this in more detail. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and one type of dementia that doesn't have this protein accumulation is vascular dementia. So it's more to do with changes in blood flow to the brain and that can trigger damage. But am I right in thinking, does that affect synapses because they're an area of vulnerability, but just in a different way? Yeah, so I, that's a great question. So we do know that vascular dementias and, and sort of small vessel diseases can cause cognitive impairments, just similar to what we see in Alzheimer's disease, but not identical. So in that, we don't suspect that we'll have the protein accumulation in the synapses. But as you said, Katie, I think that the synapses will be particularly vulnerable to that lack of oxygen. So we would predict that they would be very much affected. We do see more white matter damage in in things like small vessel disease as well which means that the communication in the white matter from one part of the brain to another will be impaired and that goes through the synapses ultimately but it could be happening a little bit more upstream perhaps in the axons instead of the synaptic terminals themselves brilliant thank you um and thinking along this kind of treatment lines of how we could try and affect the synapses in the brain is it a case of trying to stop them from disconnecting in the first place or is there a potential that actually we could try and reconnect some synapses that might have disconnected um, and then also boost communication at the ones that are still there? Is, are there kind of different approaches like that that we could take? So I think in the end, probably all of those approaches would be complementary. Um, I think in the first instance, it will always be the goal to kind of stop the, the synapses breaking down. Um, I actually... I'm not sure how far we are in regards to building synapses back up again once something has happened to them and um, because it's not really the area of my expertise. Um, but for example, one of the features that we study in the mouse model that we're working on, um, I think it relates back to the, your first question actually, is um, that as part of expand, uh, extending the lifespan, the drug that we're using um, for some reason um, also um, reduces inflammation in the brain and kind of stop like slows the decline. Um, so I think, yeah, there's still a lot we can study. Um, but I think maybe Tara has more to add to this question. Sure. I mean, that's a great point because the brain, not only is it amazing and complex, but it's very plastic, we call it. It's very malleable. So when you lose the brain cells themselves, the neurons, it's very difficult to get them back and get them wired up together. But when you lose the synapses, your brain has a mechanism for making new ones. So when you're just like sitting here today, listening to all this, you are strengthening synaptic connections and even making new ones because your brain is able to do that. So if we can stop the damage, your brain can make more connections and regain more function. And a really good example of this is if anyone knows someone who's had a stroke and right after you'll often have very bad effects. And for example, you will have trouble speaking, but you relearn, right? So you, if we can stop the damage, we can make new synapses or strengthen the existing synapses. And that would be the goal in dementias as well to try and do that. Because it's if we can do that before the neurons, too many of the neurons have died, we have a great chance of, of even maybe regaining a bit of function. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a question now for Sarah. Um, so you, you're very focused on this one type of receptor that is sensitive to this acetylcholine um, transmitter in the brain. But um, acetylcholine has effects all over the body. So is the M1 receptor also all over the body or is it just in the brain and quite specific for there? So the M1 receptor is actually also, um, I think in salivary and gastric glands mainly in addition to the brain. 
Um, but I think this also relates to why some of the treatments that we currently have, so the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, um, why they usually cause side effects. So um, there's different points on the receptor that a drug can bind to, um, and also acetylcholine. Um, and there's five different muscarinic receptors, with which M1 receptor is one of. Um, and they're kind of distributed all throughout the body. So they're also in smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, kind of everywhere in your bowels and stuff. Um, so if you kind of just upregulate acetylcholine in the whole body, which we're doing with the current treatments, that's why you get side effects because they kind of fire all over the place. Um, so that's kind of what we are trying to do with the drug that we're working on. It binds to kind of a different spot on the receptor. And the spot is a bit, you can kind of get drugs that are more specific to the M1 receptor. So that's what we're trying to kind of focus, um, yeah, the upregulation on just M1 receptor because it's mainly in the brain. It's also slightly in different locations, but not as much as all the other receptors. Um, so the hope is to get less side effects, um, but also um, just a shout out to my fellow PhD student, Miriam Scarpa. She recently, um, her paper is on um, bioarchives at the moment, but they, she, she found out that if you take away in the cell, there's not just one pathway that kind of can get activated, but if you take away one of those pathways, um, it actually makes symptoms worse, worse in the mice. So basically, if we can find drugs that target specific pathways downstream as well in the cell, we might also be able to kind of reduce the side effect profile, even though we're kind of targeting more receptors than we actually plan to. Fantastic. That's that's really interesting because um, many people listening who have family members taking some of these current drugs are probably quite aware of some of the side effects that mean some people just can't take them at all. So if we can make them more targeted, more focused, reduce those side effects, then hopefully it means that in future there will be more options and more things for people to take that have lower side effects and um, kind of on that on that tack really of like how specific do we want to go and um, kind of a big quite broad open question here do you think that there will be drugs that will work for all different types of dementia or will they work for only one type of dementia or will it get even more specific so like with cancer treatments you have to have like a really certain positivity of a certain molecule to have certain treatments like is that the way that we're going with alzheimer's and other types of dementia do you think tara I'd come to you on that yeah no that's a really good question so i think the answer is probably both um so in some ways if we could find general neuroprotective or synaptic protective treatments they would be applicable across a range of diseases that have loss of neurons uh, and I think that's particularly true for preventative things. So this idea of taking good care of your heart and preser preserving your brain function, that's going to be good for you across several different diseases, right? So the preventions, I think, will be uh, more global. But at the same time as looking for these general neuroprotective type things, and some groups around the world are looking, we are, as you, as you saw from our talks, and Sarah's and mine both, that we are also looking at very specific mechanisms. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, there is way down the line, the, the possibility of things that would be specifically targeted, for example, to that APOE4 gene. If you could take that APOE4 gene out and give yourself an APOE2 or an E3, that would really drastically reduce your risk. That's, I mean, that's still science fiction, right? But it's just illustrating the point that there are very specific things that happen in each of these diseases, and we should and are going after those, but there are more general things that we're also going after. And my, I don't know, don't have a crystal ball, but my thinking at the minute is we'll probably have a, a combination of things in the future that will help prevent and treat these diseases. And some of them will be general and some of them will be very specific. Brilliant. And I think the question that always comes second to that question is when, how long? And I know this, uh, nobody likes to put a number on this, but do you think in the next 10 years that we'll see more treatments come through? So as you mentioned, there's this one treatment that has been licensed in America and we're waiting decisions here and there's a lot of debate as to whether it actually has any merit for people with dementia. Is, is this the first one that's opened the door and we'll start to see more flood through? Is it a positive thing? Yeah, is it, when can you say? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, I can't say when, um, but that is in a way brilliant news. This this aducanumab or aducanumab being approved in the U.S. and it, it, there's a there's a little bit of controversy around it, but for the past 
couple of decades, and correct me if I'm wrong there, Katie, we've had zero new drugs approved for Alzheimer's disease, and we've had nothing at all ever that attacks the core things going on in the brain. They were all symptomatic. And this new Aduhelm drug is actually targeting the A-beta, and it lowers A-beta levels by sucking it out of the brain with an antibody. So in a way, that is amazing, because that shows that the research we've been doing over the past couple of decades across the board, a lot of it funded by Alzheimer's Research UK, has has led to the development of something that should be a disease modifying treatment the bit of a caution is <laughs> that it might it's not a miracle cure so it's it's a it's a small step in a way but and a big step in another way it's a big step in that it's a disease modifying treatment and it's a small step in that it's not sure yet to be super effective so we have to still be patient and i know how hard that is but we have to still be patient and wait for the phase four data which is the sort of post approval stuff in the US and wait and see if here in the UK it's approved for use and whether it's going to be useful because we don't want to be giving people a drug that has some risks if it's not sure to be helpful. So I'm excited, but the answer to when is in a way we've already done it. I mean, we've had a little opening crack in the door, as you say, for disease modifying treatment. So that I hope will mean we'll have more coming through soon, but it's really hard to say. <laughs> Brilliant. I did give you a very tough question there. I know it's impossible to say when, but yeah, I think there is certainly a lot of hope, a lot of progress that's been made in, in recent decades. So it's fantastic to hear from both of you about your amazing research and to hear that, yeah, we're, we're on the cusp of great things happening. So thank you so much for giving your talks today. Um, as we're approaching the, the end of our time, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to thank you both and say goodbye to you before I move on to wrap up. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Katie. Thank you to everyone for coming. I wish we could see each other in person, maybe next time. Thank you, Katie, for having me. And thank you, Tara, for presenting alongside me and yeah, for the great questions from the audience. Um, and thank you for listening. Brilliant, wonderful. So to our audience, before you dash off, just hold on with me for a couple of minutes, just a few things for us to do. Um, so we've got a couple of poll questions. We, we do love a poll um, and they will give us an insight into how you found today. So I'll just hopefully those will pop up on the screen now. Um, and it just helps us to understand if you found the event interesting or useful, if you've learned something and um, whether whether you would come back in future. And this is very nerve wracking for us here as we wait for those results to come in. So I'll just pause a minute while that happens. Brilliant. So I think we can share the results now that everyone's responded. And it's really, it's really wonderful to see that it is a positive response. So uh, majority of people agreeing that they've, uh, they would recommend these events to friends and family, that they've learned something. And lots of people saying they would plan to attend future ones. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to hear. Um, we'll also be sending a more detailed feedback survey to you tomorrow, still quite short, um, and that will just help us to know what's went well, take some comments from you as well. And it's really useful as we're starting to plan the 2022 series. So starting in January, we'll be running some more events in the Lab Notes series. And so we want to hear from you about the topics you would like to hear about, the times of day when really the series can work best for you. So uh, when you receive that, we'd be ever so grateful if you could fill it in. And then the video recording is likely to come later this week or early next week once we've got that all edited up and subtitled. So that will come in a separate email to the survey. So do watch out for those. And then next month in September, we will be having two Lab Notes events um, because September, as you might be aware, is World Alzheimer's Month. So the first is on Wednesday, the 1st of September at 3 p.m., in which we'll hear from researchers in our Yorkshire network about the insights they gain from their research using different types of microscopes to study dementia. The second event is on Tuesday, the 21st of September at 1 p.m., which is also World Alzheimer's Day. And researchers in that event are from our Southwest network, and they will introduce us to the support cells of the brain, what they do and how they're affected in Alzheimer's disease. And both events are set to be really interesting. And so I do hope that you can join us. You can find out more and sign up on our website to join us for these events and others in the series. Um, and you may have had questions today that you didn't feel you could ask and not sure where to turn to. So I'd just like to point you towards our dementia research info line. 
They can answer questions about dementia, signpost you to other organisations, and they can also help you sign up to get involved with dementia research yourself. So if you have any questions or you'd like to find out more about those things, then please do get in touch with them. So as we close, I just want to say a huge thank you for joining us today. I hope you found it interesting and useful and you'll join us again for another event in our series. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>